When I was a kid, some maths teachers were famous, but they were famous because they were very good footballers or in a rock band. They weren't famous for being a maths teacher. Eddie Wu has millions of followers on YouTube, millions of views, millions and millions, and he's here today. Let's welcome loudly Eddie Wu. Good morning, everyone. It's such a joy to be with you, and thank you, Ken, for the very uh, warm introduction. Uh, when I look out at a room like this, I get tremendously excited because I think of all of the amazing minds here that I have the wonderful privilege of helping to just a little bit shape, if, I, if you can hear me okay, and help you to wake up, not just because it's the morning, and because it's helpful to be awake early in the morning, but also because if you're like me, thank you, I'll just, I'll just stand here while like, I'm undressed. Um, if you're like me, then it isn't just physically that you need to wake up. Thank you very much, Ken. No, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I can speak into one mic and then we'll go from there. It's not just physically that you need to wake up. It's also to something much bigger and more exciting. Let me explain by giving you a bit of a confession. I'm a mathematics teacher. As Ken introduced, it's kind of the thing that I'm known for now, and so it might surprise you to hear that, and I'm old enough to say this now, when I was your age, I was not into maths at all. I was a real English and history geek. Those are the things I loved. I love stories, I love narratives, I love character and plot. And I came to mathematics much later in life, probably in my 20s, really. And I came to realize at that age, far beyond what you are now, that I had been asleep to these mathematical realities all around me. I'd been doing maths for many years, but I never really saw it around me in all the ways that it exists. There was a world that I'd been asleep to, and I was just starting to wake up. So in the time that I have with you this morning, I want to show you, I've just got enough time for three little places, three little ways in which I can hopefully open your eyes a little bit to the maths that is swimming around us every single day of the year. Fractals, knots, and flowers. What's a fractal? Let me show you. This is one of my favorite photographs. It's a satellite image of a river delta. And you can see from the bottom of the image where you've got these big wide rivers and they go further and further up into the top right hand corner and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is what river deltas do all around the world. It's a very char characteristic shape, but it's a little unusual because if you have a think about the shapes that we know about at school, most of them are things which are nice and neat, things that you could draw with a ruler or perhaps with a pair of compasses, a rectangle or a triangle or a circle, simple shapes like that. And when you have a look at this photograph, you probably don't see any shapes that match those descriptions. No parabolas, no rectangles, no triangles. And yet, there's a geometric pattern here to be understood. Let me try and illustrate it to you. Have a look up here in the top right hand corner and you can see there's a part of that river delta and I just want you to focus on that bit and you can see it sort of spreading out and getting smaller and smaller as you go towards the top right hand corner of the image. Now as you focus on that and then kind of zoom out and pull out to see the rest of the picture, do you notice that the entire river delta is kind of like that little spot but just blown up and expanded? We mathematicians have a name for this. We call it self-similarity. The same shape appears over and over again, just in smaller and smaller versions. And any shapes that have this self-similarity we call fractals. Um, has anyone here had a broken bone before? Hands up if you had a broken bone. Wow, lots of you who had very active lives or are clumsy like me. That's okay, thank you, hands down. If you had a broken bone, maybe you remember that the doctor said to you, oh, there's a fracture there. A fracture. Fracture just means broken. And that's why these shapes are called fractals. They are shapes that have been broken and shattered into many pieces, not nice and neat like a square or a circle. 
Now, why am I showing you this particular shape? Well, what mathematicians love is to say, you know what, this is not just here. It's in other places too. For instance, let's have a look at this tree for me. It is very similar to the trees that you can see just around you as you walked in here, but I picked out this particular one because I want you to have a look at the shape of the branches. Do they look familiar? Do they look similar at all to that river delta you saw on the previous page? And this is weird, isn't it? Why should a river look anything like a tree? Even more crazily, why should either of them look anything like, for instance, a bolt of lightning? We don't get to ponder shapes like this very often because they disappear as soon as they appear. But if you look at this shape and reflect on it, you'll notice it has that same fractal, broken nature. It's the same idea that if we have a look at one tiny part of the lightning bolt, it looks like the whole thing except in miniature. And it gets even better. You see, it's not just out in nature that we can see these things. Every single person in this room is made, is filled with these fractals. Except you need to pull back the surface a little bit. This, of course, is an image of what your arteries and veins look like in every single tissue in your body. And don't tell me that that doesn't look similar to the river, to the tree, to the lightning. This same geometry is what shows you that you, my friends, are connected mathematically to every other part of the universe. You can see this is something you've lived with your entire life, but you've been probably, like me, asleep to it. These are fractals. I love these shapes. They're all about gaining insight into what's there using mathematics. And to give you a bit more of a practical, something that you can do, an experience that you can have a go at this, I'm going to play a game with you. Now, when you came in, hopefully you either received a piece of paper or a little booklet or both. If you have one of those, I'd like you to get that out. And also, I'd love you to have something in your hand to write with. Now, if you have that blank piece of paper, that's great. If you've got the booklet, just turn it to any page that you've got a space to write. In fact, the back cover would be perfect. You just need a little blank space there. And I'm going to show you, that's great, fantastic. I'm going to show you how to play this game. It's called the Game of 23. Now, to play this game, it's a competitive game, so I need you to pair up with someone next to you. Can you do that? Make eye contact with someone. You might need to uh, pair it with someone behind or in front of you if someone beside you is taken. And then in your pair, I would love for you please to nominate one of you to be player one and the other person to be player two. Can you do that? And player one, once you've been chosen, please raise your hand for me and I'll know you're ready when half of you have your hands up. Nice and straight, thank you player one. I want to make sure I can see all of you up the back as well. Excellent. Okay, thank you, player one. Hands down. Player one, we're going to start with you. Please have the pen in your hand or pencil and the page at the ready. Player one, here's your first task. Player one, I would please like you to think of a whole number between one and four. Uh, inclusive, so one, two, three, or four. You can choose any of them. It's completely up to you. And once you've chosen it, uh, it's not a secret. Just write it down on your piece of paper and hand it over to your friend who's player two. Can you do that for me, please? Player one, hand it to player two. Think of your number, one, two, three, four. Your choice. And player two, once you've got the paper or the booklet, could you just hold it up for me so I know you're ready? Hold up that paper or the booklet. Still got a few people waiting on. Okay, excellent. Thank you, hands down. Okay, play it too. You have the power now, and I'm going to ask you to do something very similar, but with a subtle twist, so pay close attention. You are also going to think of a number between one and four, but before you write it down, instead of just writing your number down, instead, I'd like you please to add your number to your friends, okay? So if your friend thought of two, but the number you're thinking of is three, I'd like you to write down two plus three, which is five, okay? So five is all you need to write down. Player two, that was your turn. Once you've thought of your number and added it on, you can hand your paper back to player one. 
Now, player one, we're back to you. And this is the way the game rolls. You're going to do the same thing. Uh, you are free to choose a new number between one and four, or if you want to intimidate the person you're playing against, I hear it really psychs people out if you throw the same number at them over and over and over. So it's up to you whether you'd like to choose a new number, one, two, three, or four, or stick with the same one. And this is pretty much all the rules of the game. This is as complicated as it gets. You're going to go back and forth, but there's one last rule. And you really want to pay attention to this one, because I think it's the most important rule. It's the rule that tells you how to win the game. The astute among you will have noticed that this game has a name. It's called the game of? 23. 23, very good. The reason the game is called that is because eventually one of you will be able to write down the number 23. And that person will be the winner, okay? That's the goal. Now here's what we're gonna do. I'm about to set you loose for about two minutes, and that's so you can play this game, not just yet, it's so you can play this game. Two minutes is more than enough to play this game. I actually want you to play more than one round. Once you've played a game, swap who's player one and two, so you both have a chance at going first. See if you can work out a winning strategy. And when I come back, I'm gonna come on the stage, and I'm gonna raise my hand, and I want you, if you see me raise my hand, I'd like you to do the same. That'll be my signal that we're ready to come back together. Make sense? Good luck, you got two minutes, off you go. Much. Okay, hands down. Now, I hope you enjoyed that game. Um, I hope a lot of you felt the joy and excitement of being a winner, but I know not all of you did. And so for that reason, I want to try and use mathematics to understand what was going on here, just like we looked at fractals before, and we saw, oh, there's this wonderful pattern here that I didn't notice. I want to see if I can show you there is a wonderful pattern underneath this game that maybe you didn't notice the first time. Here's how we're going to work it out. I wonder if you could take your booklet or piece of paper, and uh, I'm going to ask you a question that requires you to look at the numbers that you wrote as you played that game. Okay, so have a look at it there. And here comes my question. Would you please raise your hand for me if, when you were playing the game, did at any stage the person you were playing against, did your opponent, did they ever write down the number 18? Could you raise your hand if this happened to you? Okay, all right? All right, quite a few, about half of you. All right, thank you, hands down. Okay, if this has happened, what happened to you, I'm just going to make a prediction as to what happened next. I'm going to predict that your friend wrote down the number 18 and handed the piece of paper to you, and you took your pen or pencil to write the next number, and then you paused. And then the next thing you said was, I don't want to play this game with you anymore. Because if this happened to you, you'll know. And if it didn't happen to you, I want you to try and imagine why. If your friend wrote down the number 18, then you've worked out no matter what you play next, they're going to win, right? Have you worked this out, right? You can choose one, two, three, or four. You can't get to 23, but they're going to get to 23 on the next term. Now, what you've worked out is when I introduced this game to you, I was lying. This is not really the game of 23, is it? 23 is not the number that really matters. This is, in fact, the game of 18. Whoever gets 18, they will win, no matter what happens next. Now, ho hold on a second. Think about this with me. Because... If the game of 23 is not really about 23, it's about 18, then doesn't it stand to reason that the game of 18 is not about 18 either? For instance, if you were playing against me, and I wrote down the number, I got to the point where I wrote down the number 13, then no matter what number you choose next, one, two, three, or four, let's suppose you chose four, for instance, I wrote down 13, you said 4, so our next number we're going to write down is 17. So I'm going to say, ooh, ooh, I know how to win. I just need to say 1, 18, game over. So wait, wait a minute. The game of 23 is not about 23, it's about 18. The game of 18 is not about 18, it's about 13. Can't I continue this pattern? 
I, I can. Um, this is not even the game of eight. This is actually the game of three, which you might have noticed is something that player one can say on their first turn. So if you were player one and you still lost, um, congratulations, I guess. Like I tried to give you an advantage, but you just threw it away. And the thing is, if you now play this game against someone, go home and play this with your mum and dad, unless they are you know, sitting next to you right now. Go home and play this with your mum and dad and just go first and say, hey, mum and dad, how are you going to go? Make sure you get to three and then eight and 13 and so on and you will win. Now, what's my point? You see there's mathematics sitting underneath here that maybe wasn't obvious before and you can use this to understand and appreciate the world better. All right. I promised three things, right? Fractals was the first one and I showed you that one already. Does anyone remember what the second one was? Started with a K. Can you shout it out to me? Very good. Knots. This is a mathematical knot. It's one of my favorites. Um, you can't exactly put your shoelaces into this shape, but you can see there's this tangled web of different connections and rings. And I want you to notice why this is an unusual shape. Um, there's lots of things to see here. Firstly, you might notice it's about well, it's about 60% of an Olympic logo, so that's kind of cool. But the main thing about this, this is, that is weird or interesting requires your imagination. So can you use your imagination with me for a second, okay? I'd like you to pick one of the rings that's on the screen. Okay, pick one of the rings, the red or the green or the blue. Just lock it in your mind. And then here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to notice, do you see, all three rings are interconnected right now. Do you see that? You can't pull them apart. In fact, I have a friend, and uh, he's married like I am, and his wedding band is actually three rings joined together just like this. It's meant to be a symbol of unity, and it's unbreakable. You can't pull them apart. But do you remember that ring you chose, the red or the blue or the green one? Here's what I want you to do. In your mind's eye, I wonder if you can make it so that you can see this picture and make that ring, the one you chose, disappear. Can you see the picture without the ring that you chose? Can you imagine it without the ring there? Good, now if you can, you might have noticed something weird happened. If you made that ring disappear successfully in your mind, do you see the other two rings? They suddenly seem to have nothing to do with each other. They're completely separate. What's up with that, right? Okay, now, you're all excited and this is just my first slide on knots. Okay, now, where am I taking this? Mathematicians thought, this is weird, this is unusual. We need to understand this. Let's try and break this down to something simpler because this is very complicated, okay? So what they did was they said, well, this is made up of three of these, three rings, right? Now, this is not a very knotty kind of shape. It's not tangled up at all. And so that's why this thing is called the Unknot. There's no knot there, okay? It's just a ring. But you have to be careful with the unknot, right? For example, if you have a look at this guy, this knot looks a little more complicated. But again, if you can use your imagination and take these two twisted loops here, if you can untwist them in your mind, hopefully you see this is the same as the unknot before, right? It just looks a little different. Now, when you have a look at something as terrible looking as this, I mean, this is what looks like my headphones when I put them in my pocket, right? But with patience, you can untwist this as well, and it will return back to the unknot. But not all knots do this. For instance, this is what is called the trefoil knot. The trefoil knot, um, tre is like the French word, tre, which means three, and foil, that's from the same place where we get the word foliage. So this is the three-leafed knot, which you can see why it's that way, why it's got that name. The three-leaf knot, no matter how many times you twist and turn it, will never turn back into the unknot. It always has these one, two, three places where it crosses over itself. You can never get rid of them. And the way I know that is because I tried. This is a, um, a skipping rope that my daughter used to use, and uh, it was all broken and tattered, so it's not much use for skipping anymore. So I took it, and I tied its ends together, and I stuck them together in the shape of the trefoil. Now, hopefully you can see, let's see if this will work. Wonderful. You've got one, two, three places where the trefoil crosses itself. I've highlighted them there for you. And no matter how many times you shift this thing around, and believe me, I really tried, <laughs> you will always get 
three crossings. One, two, three, one, two, three. You can always count them. Okay? Now, mathematicians thought, well, this is interesting. Where can we take this? Where else can we go with this? This is what happens when you have a knot that crosses itself three times. This is what happens when you have a knot that crosses itself four times or five times. Now, these start to get a bit crazy and complicated, but hopefully the question in your mind right now is, what's the point of all this? Why would we bother investigating shapes like these? Why should we care? Let me explain. Unless you are an identical twin here in the room, which in a room of this size, I'm sure we have at least a few. Wonderful, excellent. Wow, three. Okay, I can see you two next to each other. That's great. For everyone else, us regular people here in the room who aren't quite that special, there's a certain thing about you that makes you unique and different to every single other person on the planet. It's something we call deoxyribonucleic acid. You might know it better by its acronym. We call it DNA. DNA. Very good. Now, DNA is amazing stuff. Genetic code, which tells us everything about who you're going to grow up into, physically speaking, okay? All of it is written here in your genetic code. There's so much code that makes you who you are that even though it's literally microscopic, you need a microscope to see it. If I took the DNA out of just one of your cells, even though it's microscopic, if I stretched it out along the ground in a straight line, it would be two meters long. So microscopic you can't see it, but that's how long it would be. Two meters, just in one cell. Now, here's what I love about this, right? You have, of course, more than one cell in your body. The average human being has about 37 trillion cells in their body. So if we took the DNA out of every single one of those, don't worry, we, we won't do it. I think it would probably hurt if we did. But if we did, and I laid all of that DNA from all of your cells out in a straight line, it would stretch out 74 billion kilometers. That's just the DNA in your body. Now, if you're like me, 74 billion kilometers, that's a number that's like way too big for my brain to kind of compute. I don't understand what 74 billion kilometers looks like, so let me try and paint you a picture, okay? Here's what 74 billion kilometers would be like. The sun is very far away, which is, which is a good thing, by the way, because the sun is basically a nuclear explosion that is going off every second of every day, and it's really good to be far away from that, so instead of being blown up, we just get gently warmed on our face. That's nice, right? The sun is far away. If you traveled all the way to the sun and came all the way back to Earth, and if you did that round trip 250 times, that would be 74 billion kilometers. Now, that's a long way, right? Hopefully that gives you a better picture of it. Now, hopefully you're asking this question inside your head right now. How can all of that DNA in me fit inside? 74 billion kilometers. And the answer is, inside your cells, at this very second, your DNA, it's in knots. It's all squished into this tiny compressed space. And that's how so very much DNA can fit in so very little space. In fact, there are enzymes in your body, and their sole reason for existing is just to tie and untie your DNA into different kinds of knots. That would be really handy for my headphones. So, I've shown you fractals. I've shown you knots. I wanted to finish on one last spot. Do you remember what it was? Thank you. Flowers. I love flowers. Uh, flowers are amazingly beautiful things for many reasons. Part of why is that if you look at any flower, they pretty much all have this very special kind of symmetry. Here's how you can tell. If you take a flower and you rotate it around, no matter which way you rotate it, it always looks the same, right? It's the same one. You can actually see, if you look closely, I have turned it 90 degrees, but they all look more or less identical. That's because of their symmetry. Now, the rotational symmetry that a flower has is really special. I want to illustrate it to you in this way, right? Can you see those yellow little florets that are in the middle there? Those bits that carry the pollen, which the bees come and they feed on, all that kind of thing? Well, what happens is, rather than growing in straight lines, you know, when we humans build things, we build things in straight lines. You build these houses and then these houses and these houses. That's not how flowers grow. Flowers grow 
organically. So what happens is they grow from the center and then outwards they go, and they rotate as they do that. Now, if we took a flower and we said, here's what I want you to do, flower. I'd like you to turn around 90 degrees every time you send out a new little floret. That's what those yellow things are called. Turn 90 degrees every time you do it. Then this is the shape that you would get. Do you see why? You turn 90 degrees every time. You've got a right angle between all of those. Now it looks kind of cool, but it doesn't look much like a flower, does it? So let's try something different. Instead of 90 degrees, let's suppose I wanted to turn around, uh, let's call it about 35 degrees. This is a much smaller angle. Well, if I turn 35 degrees every time I sent out one of these florets, you get this kind of shape. And that's lovely, isn't it? You're like, oh, that looks more like a flower to me. It's got that lovely kind of roundness to it. But also, while it's nicer, for a flower, this is not very good because you can see these black spots here. You see those? They're kind of wasted, aren't they? You're like, man, I could have fit more stuff in here. So instead of turning 90 degrees, instead of turning 35, what if we tried an angle like, oh, I don't know, 137 and a half degrees. Now you might say 137 and a half degrees, that sounds like a terrible angle. Why would you do that? It even sounds weird. Well, here's why. 137 and a half degrees turning around every time. This is the shape that we get. Now, do you hear that sound? Did you hear that sound that you just gave off? That's the sound of waking up to mathematics. Because in fact, this is not just something I can animate, this is something I can show you a photograph of. This is what sunflowers do all around the world every single day, using mathematics to send out all of their different florets. It's beautiful. Mathematics is beautiful. Now, I hope through fractals, knots, and flowers, and so many other things that this has helped you see, if you wake up to this wonderful world, there's no end for the things that you can enjoy with mathematics. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eddie. Now, we do have some time for some questions, and I'm sure there will be some. I do need to show you again this wonderful book, Wu's Wonderful World of Maths. And it is not really about maths, it's about the wonder of the world and of life itself, as well as maths. And I have learned a lot from this book. I wonder if we have any questions. I'll just tell you one thing that I learned from this book. Any questions on this side? Oh, there's one right here on the edge. One of the things I learned from this book is why rainbows are curved. Um. You don't have to ask about rainbows. Did you, can you ask hear about that? Anything you like. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the cogs turning. What did you want to ask? Um, I asked why is the sky blue? Why is the sky blue? Okay, all right. Dr. Carl is coming onto this stage <laughs> shortly, and I feel really embarrassed to give this answer, but I will do it nonetheless, okay? Um, in fact, it's the same idea with rainbows. Now, we've seen rainbows before, right? You know, after it rains and if the sun is just right, you can see all of these different colors that come out. It's quite beautiful, right? Now, what's great about a rainbow is it shows you the light that comes to us to our eyes from the sun isn't just all made of one color, white. It's actually made of all these different colors. And what happens is when the light comes down, I actually want all of you right now, just turn around so you can see the windows just out there, okay? Now, just have a look at the glass out there. Do you notice... When the light comes through that glass, you can tell it's come through glass because it's sort of like a sort of color, right? It looks kind of bluish to me. It's kind of tinted. Does that make sense? You can see it's like, oh, that's not from the sun. That's reflected. It's come through something else. Okay, come and look back up here now, right? The light that comes from the sun does this too, even when you're outside, even when it feels like there's no glass between you and the sun because there is the atmosphere. And what it does is it spreads out all of those different colors that are in the rainbow, and it spreads some of them out so they get absorbed, it spreads some of them out so they get reflected, and other ones just pass right through. And the main ones that pass right through are the blue ones, and that's what we see. So I hope that answers that question. I forgot. 
<laughs> That's okay. Here on the aisle? Yeah. What's your favorite type of maths? What's my favorite type of maths? Wow. Um, I, this question is a little bit like asking, uh, what, who is your favorite child? I have three children. I'm not meant to say any of them is my favorite, though most of the parents in the room here know probably what is your favorite. Um, but for me, when I think about mathematics, I feel like one of my most enduring favorites is about geometry. That's all these shapes that I showed you just today. Um, because if you have a look at these snowflakes, I didn't even talk about these, right? Snowflakes, again, uniquely form with this six-fold symmetry. Do you see that? See how it's got those six parts that always go out? Has to do with the shape of a water molecule and the way that it faces and can fit together. And for me, Geometry is wonderful because even if I can't be very good at crunching numbers, I can still see and appreciate that mathematics. So that's why I like geometry. Um, how did you find out all this information? How did I find out? Um, I have this real belief that life is too short to only learn from your own mistakes. You have to learn from others as well. So I've had all of these wonderful mentors who I've been able to pick their brains and say, hey, can you explain this to me? Um, sometimes I often have to start by saying, this is gonna sound like a really dumb question. But I've learned that the only dumb question is the one that isn't asked because it never gets an answer. So I've spent my entire life asking lots of questions that make me a little bit embarrassed when I ask them, but I get to learn so much stuff having asked them by the end. And also, I try to read and listen to a lot of things, so they all feed into my brain as well. How are snowflakes all symmetrical? Ah, okay, so snowflakes, I'm just gonna give you the short answer for this because I know how quickly the time is running out. Snowflakes are made of water, basically. And some of you might know, water is made of uh, three different molecules that fit together. Uh, two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen. So here's what I want you to do. You're gonna need a friend to do this, though. When you sit next to each other, I want one of you in the pair to put two of your hands together, like, a fi like two fists together. Can you do that? Okay, two fists. And then hold your, your hand out to your friend. Now your friend, here's what I want you to do. I want you, and where's, where's Ken, actually, I'm gonna need, can you come up on the stage with me? What's your name? Charlie. Charlie, come on up. Can you give Charlie a clap, please? Come on, Charlie. Now, Charlie's gonna illustrate with me what I want you to illustrate as well. Charlie, I'll take that booklet for you. I'll hold that for a second. Now, can you hold the, those two fists out for me, just like I mentioned before? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. And Charlie, I'm gonna face you toward the audience. Okay, now, here's your oxygen molecule in the middle, and then you've got these two hydrogen molecules that kind of sit almost like the ears of Mickey Mouse on the top. Do you see that, right? And they all like to fit in that particular way. Now, do you see how we kind of have this V-shape? See that? See that V-shape that you're making? Okay, now, when Charlie and I make this water molecule together, if we had a few hundred more friends on the stage with us, if we tried to fit all of these together, they all fit together and they make this kind of shape, a little bit like our Lego, it fits into straight lines because of its shape. This little water molecule is always going to fit into arrangements of six like you can see on the snowflakes. So that's the short answer. Thanks, Charlie, for your help. There you go. Can we give her a clap? Eddie, there's so many people that want to ask questions <laughs> and we are actually out of time. Oh. It's a real shame. I'm hoping, though, there's some other way that they can ask you things. Well, um, if you go online and if you look for my name, um, you'll probably find my YouTube channel or Instagram or whatever, and um, you can shoot me a message or get your parents to send me an email through there. I get questions all the time, and um, I, I love the curiosity that people have in the room and would love to honor that. So There is a lot of curiosity, on. and I can tell you that this will actually answer questions that you didn't even know that you had. It is a wonderful book and it's good for all ages and I congratulate you on this, Eddie. This is a really great way to learn about the world and the world of maths. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ken. <laughs>